what I love about this under <laughs> underrepresented plant is that when people do get a taste of it, it's like something triggers some kind of memory, something. It's a unique flavor that you can't get anywhere else and you want more of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I'm alone. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. Well, today I'm happy to bring you this conversation with Stacy Murphy. Her joyful love of the garden and all the beings that reside there is so readily apparent in this interview. She was truly a delight to chat with, and I know that you'll also be falling in love with celery all over again. For those of you who don't already know her, Stacy was an engineer and an architect with a busy job and a long commute. It frustrated her that she could manage complex projects at work, but a vegetable and herb garden seemed impossible to fit into everyday life. In 2009, she was taught techniques for growing tons of organic vegetables and herbs in a small space with not a lot of effort. Since then, she has been obsessed with helping people create good garden habits that fit into their busy schedule and most importantly, fit their personality. Grow Your Own Vegetables began as an idea with her fellow students and gardeners to show how shockingly simple it can be. It's their mission to support 1 million beginning gardeners to cultivate successful vegetable and herb gardens so that you too can enjoy a grocery aisle right in your own yard or even inside your house. Well, welcome to the show, Stacy. Thank you so much, Rosalie. It's so wonderful to be here. Well, I'm really excited just to dive in and I want to hear more about what really pulled you into the gardening world and the plant world. Well, so what's interesting about my story is there was a forgetting and a remembering. So when I was a kid, uh, I was lucky to have two parents who were gardening and they were gardening because they were poor and they needed to grow food in order to have healthy food to eat. And so my mom had this amazing garden. And I remember being in that garden and picking peas right off the plants and eating them right in the garden and how delicious that was and how magical that was that I could just eat plants and hang out with the plants all day. And one of my favorites was the black raspberry br bramble because I was small enough to kind of get in there and I could mm -hmm. eat all of the black raspberries before anybody else. So I was lucky enough to just really enjoy food straight out of a garden. And I had a dad who loved to teach me bird calls. And he also loved to teach me what trees were, were, were what by the shape of the leaves and the nuts and all these different things. So I had a family that just loved being outdoors. And I took it for granted, I think. And I went off to college and I studied engineering and architecture and got a little bit busy designing buildings. And all of a sudden, one day I was at the farmer's market and ate a carrot that was covered in soil. Um, the farmer had brought it to the farmer's market, still covered in soil because he knew that the, the freshness would stay, the more soil was on it. And I remember eating this carrot and it was like a shock to the system. It was like, what have I been doing all these years? I was 35 mm -hmm. and I and I thought, I got to get back to plants. And so that was the year that I decided no matter what, I lived in a tiny little Brooklyn apartment, I was going to find a backyard and I was going to start growing some food. And uh, that's what I did. <laughs> oh, I love that story on so many levels. It, your remembering story makes me remember that I also grew up with, you know, I have that heritage of gardeners for the same reason. You know, there's, I think there was a love of gardening, but also it was very practical because mm -hmm. my family was poor and that was the way we ate our food and 
I remember eating the strawberries from the patch and, you know, and all of that, you know, so I have that remembering as well. But I also love that you were in Brooklyn in an apartment and you're just like, I'm making this happen. This is, yes. this is what I'm doing. Yes. Yeah. And I started right away with trays on shelves, uh, even though I couldn't grow outdoors yet. So I, whatever I needed to do to make it happen, I needed some fresh food right away. And I needed, I needed to know that I had that connection to the plants too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I love that so much. I, you know, I live on 20 acres and I have a huge garden now. Um, so sometimes I'm, you know, can be seen as more like, like I have access to a lot of things that someone in an apartment in Brooklyn might not have. So, or other urban settings. So I love that it's, there's a way to make this happen. You can be a gardener wherever. Yeah. What was phenomenal about that first winter too, is I had these two trays on shelves. They were just your standard kind of bookshelves and had a couple grow lamps and I had all of my salad makings. And then I loved growing herbs mixed into the salad. Mm -hmm. So I would grow basil and parsley and cilantro all mixed in there. And even a little little baby scallions and all kinds of stuff. Anything I could to add flavor to my salad. So I had these two little trays. And I was growing salad. And I was eating salad almost every day out of these trays. So mm -hmm. no matter how, no matter where you live, you can. there's always something that you can grow to eat fresh. Mm, I love it. Well, Stacey, so I'm, I'm just going to be straight up honest here. I was surprised and then delighted that you chose celery uh, because, you know, they're just like, oh, celery. Interesting. I didn't see that coming. But I will confess that celery is actually one of my very favorite foods. And it is critical. Like the flavor of celery is so critical for my comfort foods like turkey and dumpling soup mm. and stuffing. So that's, I am delighted that you chose it. And before we went live on the air, you mentioned it's an underrated vegetable. That's why you chose it. I was like, you're right. It is the humble celery. So I want to hear more from you about why, why you chose celery. Awesome. Yeah, it is definitely one of the most underrated vegetables. So underrated, in fact, that I have memories of my mom saying it's not worth it to grow celery. Um, I have memories of when I first started growing in Brooklyn, I started an urban farming business and we were growing food in people's backyards. And I remember people saying, oh, don't, you know, I would, I would mention celery and they would say, oh, don't bother with that one, you know, and so many people saying, oh, don't bother with that kind of thing. And for years I was growing food for other people and I was, I was, I was like, well, they don't seem to want it, so we're not going to grow it. And then one day I was, it was one of those days when I went to the um, nursery, the plant nursery, and they had all the little seedlings and I was looking for the perfect seedlings for the next, uh, the next growing season. And I saw these celery seedlings and I re I couldn't resist. I reached over. I have to tell, I haven't told anybody this ever. I reached over and I actually broke off a little bit of celery and I popped it in my mouth and I ate it right there on the spot. And I had this memory of, oh my gosh, I used to fight with my mom about who would eat the heart of the celery. So mm -hmm. celery was one of those foods growing up that we had quite a bit of, not from our garden, but from the grocery store. And I remember we'd get to the center part of that celery and we would all fight over who got the leafy green in the middle because it had so much flavor in it. And it, what a weird kid I was who liked <laughs> the celery, the heart of the celery. And my mom would love the, the celery that actually had the leaves that you could kind of cut up and put on top of the salad. And so I just had that memory. And so I said, you know what? I don't care what everybody says. I'm going to go and I'm going to plant this. And I, I brought it back to a backyard farm. I was growing for a CSA for a group of six different families. And I planted the celery and I thought, well, I'm just going to eat the celery. It doesn't take up that much space. That's the amazing thing about celery is it doesn't take up that much space in the garden. And, and so I thought, well, I'll just plant it for me. And it started growing. And of course, the homeowner was out every day looking at things and said, what's that? And I said, well, that's celery. And she said, oh, I didn't know you were going to plant celery. And she did the same thing I did. She reached out and she actually pulled a piece off and put it in her mouth. And she said, oh my gosh, this is the most flavorful celery that I've ever had. And I was like, I know, isn't it amazing? <laughs> And so that was what started my second love affair was that homegrown celery. You know, the stuff that you get at the store is all big and water, you know, 95% of it is water. And the stuff that you grow in your garden tends to be a little bit denser. The flavor tends to be a little bit denser because the amount of water you would have to water in order to get the plant that plump and juicy, 
you just don't typically do that at your home garden. And so I started growing um, just, you know, to have that memory of that flavor. And ever since then, I've been obsessed. And there's different varieties you can grow at home. And the one of my favorite things is that when I went to California and I thought, well, now I'm in a desert. Come on. Like New York City is one thing. It gets rain, you know. But now I'm in a desert and I'm going to try to grow some celery. Really, this seems really like not a good idea. How much water am I going to have to water in order to get any amount of celery? Because celery, or, it's a water loving plant. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked to find out that it's even better in the desert. Um, hmm. Yeah. And the plant is a little bit smaller in the desert and it's even more potent. It's even more delicious. And there's several different varieties that are out there. There are cutting celeries that are more about leaves and there is like a tall Utah. There's different types that you can that you can get. And they all have slightly different flavors, slightly different colors. And here's the best part. I was living in an intentional community. And every morning I would make a smoothie. And I would put in kale and chard and a little bit of celery and some herbs. I would put in there basil and sorrel and I, I, just all the greens in the garden. Yum. <laughs> it was amazing. And I would have this drink and... My housemates would say, this is so incredible. You got to tell us how to make this. And I would go out there and I would show them how to cut all the things and how to make it. And what started happening in that intentional community was all of a sudden the celery became the thing that everybody wanted. Hmm. Uh, pe people realized how delicious it was and we couldn't plant enough of it. It kept going faster and faster and faster. So what I love about this under <laughs> underrepresented plant is that when people do get a taste of it, it's like something triggers some kind of memory, something, it's a unique flavor that you can't get anywhere else and you want more of it. Hmm. So I don't think I'm alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It does have such a particular aromatic flavor to it, which as you're talking, I'm connecting all these dots in my head of like, yeah, store-bought celery is like super watery and there's not like people might describe the taste as bland, right? You know, celery tastes bland, but I have had a few times in my life, more of the, um, you know, homegrown stuff. And it is like that flavor intensifies and it's so lovely. So and what, yeah, I was, I was going to mention one more thing is if you're ever in a place that is sort of deserty, but you're in a place where there's a river running through, oftentimes you'll see wild celery growing. And if you know what celery looks like, you it's unmistakable in the wild. And so you can even in Throughout uh, San Diego, there's a couple of different hikes. There's one in Penasquitos Valley, and I go along and I just forage for wild mm. celery along the way. It's just phenomenal. Hmm. Well, one of my questions is, how easy is it to grow? Like, for example, I live in four season area, mm -hmm. uh, very short growing season, desert. What are my chances? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think your chances are pretty good as long as you have a daily watering practice um, mm -hmm. in a desert. So that's the trick to a desert area and celery. Um, so with a lot of different gardens, I, I love I love helping people with gardens. And in a lot of places, you can get a um, you can get away with only watering once a week. You can have an irrigation system. I would recommend probably an irrigation system if you're in a desert. And what's nice is you can put the celery right on the irrigation line, and mm -hmm. it'll ensure that it gets some water. So what's beautiful about celery is, like I said, I've grown it in New York City, which has four different seasons. It's got winter, fall, spring, and summer. And you can grow it pretty much all the way from spring into really late fall. It's one of the fine, like the last plants to go. And then when you're in the desert, you do, you do want to make sure you've got some water each day because it is a water lover and it will shrink really fast, really fast if it doesn't get water every day. And the beautiful thing about celery is that in most conditions, there is very few pests or diseases that affect celery. And so you don't see aphid um, damage. You don't see some of the typical like caterpillar damage. You don't see a lot of the things. And every once in a while, you're, if your garden has a kind of soil issue, you might see some kind of issue. But for the most part, I've grown it I've grown it in so many conditions and I don't think I've ever had a pest problem on my celery, which is kind of phenomenal. Yeah. Um, 
The one type of scenario I would be curious about uh, for more data is very hot and humid. That's a spot that I don't know that I've grown celery yet. Um, the humidity feels like it would help. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm curious, maybe there's somebody out there who has some data for us. <laughs> yeah, I personally refuse to grow in hot, humid weather myself. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in the super dry area. So and I love it. All right. Yeah. I'm so excited to grow celery this year. And I'm going to try and I think I'm going to put it in with my lettuce. That yes. might be good, you know, because I know that will take more more water. So Oh, yeah. I'm so inspired to grow celery this year. I grow so many, but I've never even attempted to grow it. So yeah. <laughs> And That's I mentioned, exciting. I love it in turkey dumpling soup, like turkey mm -hmm. dumpling soup without celery is just like, it's probably not worth having. Uh, I love it in um, pot pies, again, like it just has to be in there. And you shared a recipe with us for a fresh and crispy tossed salad. Yes. Uh, will you share a little bit about that? Yes. One of the best things about this recipe is that it was created by a teenager. Um, and so this recipe, so fresh and crispy, uh, one of the things that we were always looking for on the farm was fun recipes that were unique, that were delicious. And so we would teach youth how to make recipes and that they would go out and they would pull the different ingredients. Mm -hmm. And we had a celery challenge once. And we said, okay, you know, this is the most underrated vegetable. Everybody thinks a celery is a throwaway vegetable that you only put in soup. But let's see if we can make it the star of the show. And like, let's see if we can make it shine a little bit. And so one of the things that we used to teach the youth about making recipes was, you know, you need something crispy, you need something spicy, you need something uh, salty, you need something kind of tangy, you need something sweet, like you need all these different things in order to put when you put it in your mouth, it just feels like every part of your mouth is in pleasure, like, you know, t tantalizing all of the different taste buds. And so this kid walked around the farm, and he basically looked at the recipe, and he said, Okay, I need something sweet, let's grab some apples. All right, I need some and he and he said, well, we're going to do a celery recipe. That's the whole point. So I'm going to grab some celery. And um, and then he looked at, okay, we need something a little spicy. And he picked some onion. And he said, okay, we need something a little tangy. And he picked some vinegar. He picked some apple cider vinegar. And then he kind of looked around and he was filling in the gaps of the recipe. And he pulled ingredients that I don't think any of us would have pulled together. Um, so this recipe has mint and sage combined in equal parts along with the celery, a little bit of onion, the, the, the apple, and then oil and vinegar, and salt and pepper to taste, of course. And when those flavors come together, there's something really unique in the way those flavors come together. The, the, the celery has this very aromatic crispiness to it, but the sage and the mint help them combine a bit as well. So it has this flavor that's like better than all of the pieces separate, it comes together and is very unique. So I wanted to share it with the world and uh, and have people fall in love with celery all over again. <laughs> oh, it sounds so flavorful and delightful. I cannot wait to make it. So I, I'm pretty sure I have everything on hand right now. So yeah. that's going to be happening really soon. And if, you, and if you want to fill it out into more of a meal, you can always cook up some quinoa and mix it in. I will say that that dilutes the flavor a little bit, you know, so you might want to taste a little bit ahead of time and see, you know, what you want to do. And then the other thing that we found is that some, some people are allergic to nuts. And so we oftentimes will leave the nuts out of a recipe, but this particular recipe is really good with a little bit of cashew as well. Mm. Um, that's another, another way to go with this recipe. Well, lovely. Well, thank you so much for sharing the recipe with us and for the listeners, if you'd like to download your free recipe card, then you can visit the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com. Well, Stacey, uh, do you have anything else to add about celery? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, there, I just I'm like, it's one of those things that this plant speaks to me. And I am not an herbalist by training. I am an herbalist more by experimentation and love of plants. And this plant, there's something about this plant that speaks to me about um, 
the strength to grow straight and strong, um, the, mm -hmm. the, um, the crispiness, there's something about it that whenever I, how resilient it is, you know, that here it is, this plant that somehow stands upright and we eat the stem of it. And it's, it's unlike any other plant out there. Um, and so to me, this plant reminds me to kind of hold my head high, to stand up straight, to, um, to, to be a little sassy. For me, crispy equates to a little bit of sassiness, I guess. And then that it has this kind of floralness that's um, unique, I would say, mm -hmm. and a reminder to be our unique self. And even when uh, we get mixed, you know, these recipes, oftentimes the celery is underrated and it goes into soups and other things as kind of background ingredients. Like you said, without it, the recipe just doesn't hold together. And so this feeling of being one with everything, that, that we matter, that we are a part of the biodiversity of nature, that we were something unique that's needed, that our voice is needed every day. That's what celery always reminds me of. So um, it speaks to me on a spiritual level. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. I feel like I just fell in love with celery all over again. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Well, I know that you currently have a joyful garden docu-series going on right now, and I am so excited for it. I just, I already just want to like sit at your feet and learn all about gardening all over again. So uh, tell us about that series. Well, one of the things I love about this series is that we had all these lessons that we learned from our students. So we have courses like Grow Your Own Vegetables and How to Grow $400 in 40 Days. And these courses are really they're, they're a systematic approach to growing food that really came from my intuition at, at, at its heart. And so we have all these students who've put it into practice over the years in all these different locations. And so what's really fun about this docu-series is that we feature not only some of the lessons from our courses directly, but then we also show what our students have done with the course. And so you get to see firsthand how, how they've interpreted the course, what they've learned. And what's fun is people like Shannon, I mentioned how I got started growing food indoors. Uh, one of the features is about Shannon and she had a indoor uh, winter garden because most of the year it was too cold to grow. And she had a disease, I, I don't remember which disease it is because I, I lose track of all these chronic food related diseases. And basically, she started gardening and started eating all fresh food. And she went back to the doctor and the doctor said, it's gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, how incredible is it that fresh food really is the answer to so many things? And here she is growing in a closet. It's really fun to mm -hmm. see. It's, it's a closet that's glowing purple next to her. It's really fun. And, um, and then we've got people who are first timers who this, this always lights me up is somebody who is a first time grower it's complete magic to watch them grow because they've never seen a seed sprout that they've planted. They've never seen that plant grow into food and eaten it. And so one of my favorites is Linda. She took our how to grow $400 in 40 days class and she really took it to heart. And she said, well, if Stacy is planting things this close together, I'm going to plant them even closer. I'm going to put more plants in because who knows, maybe a lot of them are going to die. And she just, she packed in so many plants and she shows a video of her garden just exploding with food, <laughs> so much food that um, that she had to give so much away. And so I just really love that this docu series, at its heart, is about the joy, the surprise, and wonder of discovering food again, of of your connection with the plants, seeing the wellness and abundance of nature. And knowing that you're taken care of, that these plants are here to care for you and the nourishment and the nurturing that the plants do for you in the process. So that's what's really exciting to me about this docuseries. If anything comes through, I hope it's that feeling of how much nature is here for us and mm -hmm. how wonderful it is to see things for the first time, new insects that you've never seen before in your garden. Um, when those honeybees come and show up and you're like, oh my gosh, how blessed are we that these creatures come and pollinate our tomatoes? I, you don't even know where they came from, you know, and they just know exactly where to go. So 
I, I, I just love our new students who discover that surprise and that delight of what's going to show up for them in their yard. It's unique mm -hmm. for everybody. Oh, I love that so much. I feel like that's, I, you know, when I first started gardening, I definitely had to like, I don't think I can do this kind of mentality. <laughs> I had a lot of like fear too. Of like, oh, am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? So I love that you're showing these success stories and what success looks like to a lot of different people because my garden isn't going to look like someone else's garden, et cetera. But what you said about the nature connection, that what is what I think for many of us, myself included, pulls me back to the garden every year is that deep joy and also deep connection. And there's there was a moment last year that I've thought about so often since I was in the garden and I was taking a break. So I was sitting down and I was sitting and there was a red clover bush that was just kind of right off like a foot away from my head. And this hummingbird start was visiting the red clover bush. And so it's just, and I love hummingbirds. So let me, the hummingbirds just drinking away from the red clover. And while that, and I was trying to like, look, but like, not, you know, like <laughs> be all chill about it. So I wouldn't scare the hummingbird away. And then in just to, to the right and in front of me, I have these echinacea plants and there were red wing, black, or not red wing, um, wax wing a couple of wax wings there and one of them was sitting on top of the echinacea it was obviously the lookout while the other wax wing was on the ground looking oh. for seeds or whatever they they might be looking for and then while all that was going on there was a house friend that was nearby making their beautiful music and it was just this moment of just pure deep joy and yeah. that is you know that's a day in the garden and yeah. that's just like my dad would call this cheap entertainment, but it's like, you know, cheap <laughs> in some ways, but like not cheap and not, you know, so deeply enriching. And yeah, it's, a, it's the joy of gardening. Oh, it's gorgeous. And, and like you said, I think a lot of people, they're nervous to get started. You know, am, am I going to do it right? All these things. You're always going to do it right. You're going to discover the lessons you need to learn. It's going to be special for you. And, and then the other thing that happens for people, the second challenge that comes is the abundance of nature is wild and it will explode in ways in your garden. Everything will show up, like you'll plant things and then all of a sudden all the insects will show up and all the animals will show up and all the life will show up. And you think you might be doing something wrong, but you're doing everything right. Um, that just means that everybody's been invited to the party and it's just gonna take a little while for it all to balance itself out. And just when you think you can't take it any longer because it just keeps exploding, there's more to do, more to do. There's like vining happening. There's harvest happening. There's all of this stuff exploding. Just when you think you can't take any more, usually the season changes. And then it gives <laughs> you a little bit of a break and then you're ready for the next year. So those are the typical challenges that people face. And it really just, it really is the abundance of nature nourishing us and our ability to receive it all is, mm. is pretty magical. Yeah, oh, it is. Well, I am personally excited to see this docuseries. And for anyone else who's interested, you can visit the link in the video description or go to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com and you get your free access to the Joyful Garden docuseries. I'm super excited. Awesome. Looking forward to seeing you guys there. <laughs> My last question for you, Stacey, is one that I ask everyone in season three. I feel like it's kind of like cheating to ask a gardener this because as I know, there's always something new. And that's my question. <laughs> what new things in the plant world are exciting you these days? Well, you know, this is going to be very interesting, um, my answer. So I am obsessed with quantum biology lately. And um, I read a book called Life on the Edge, which is about quantum biology, if anybody wants to read it, and some amazing things in that book. And it got me thinking about how the garden works together and this, the concept of the energetics of the plants. And if you've ever seen the IKEA study where one plant, there are two plants grown identically and one plant was bullied and said, you suck, you're never going to amount to anything. And the other plant was loved and people and little kids whispered to it, you're so beautiful. You're so, you're growing so tall. I love you. And the two plants, everything else was identical. The soil, the water, the sunlight, everything was identical. And the one that got bullied, no surprise, looked really ragged and mm -hmm. decaying. And the one that got loved was larger, visibly larger by like a foot and greener and lusher and less dead, dead weight around it. 
And so it got me thinking about the energetics of growing and and the concept that resonant frequencies, um, that what's going on underground with all these root systems, right? That they all communicate to each other. And through the air, we know we can only see a tiny fraction of the light spectrum, the electromagnetic light spectrum. We know we can only hear a tiny fraction. And there's all this other information that's out there. And so I thought about how plants speak to me, right? And my my attachment to them and how other people seem to have this communication with plants as well, that we're reading plants on this other layer. And so what I'm really excited about these days is the as a concept of a lot of people have worked with crystals in the garden, you know, charging crystals with moonlight and um, putting crystals near plants. And I keep having these visions of a very particular crystal. And I'm working with a guy who creates pyramids from from uh, different materials, earth materials, and he infuses them with intentions and also different resonant frequencies. And I'm I have this vision that I know that there's data around food growing around the pyramids back in the day. That there was data around that food growing faster, and there people are working to recreate some of that data. And so I keep having this vision of these smaller pyramids with resonant frequencies and intentions that if they were set throughout the garden, that you might find that plants grow faster, that depending on the intention, what, you know, what do we, what kind of love and attention do we want to put on our plants and what might happen as a result? So this is something that I'm super geeked out about lately. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds really cool yeah I love like you, or, you know there's just so much more always and I love well how about I'll say this if I was going to use one word to describe you Stacey it would be joyful and I love that I just see yeah. that coming out with you know the resonance and just wondering how many how much more joy and love can I pour into my garden that's that's what I'm hearing right that's the yeah. question that's always the question I like to call that a wonder-filled question mm-hmm. um, and part of the most recent course that I taught was called Spirit Gardening. It was really about that. It was about how can you ask wonder-filled questions and play in your garden with all the childlike curiosity uh, so that you can experience and grow and evolve into even more love and joy. So that I love that you're seeing that as a result of all the questions that I've been asking my gardens. <laughs> mm-hmm. well, so beautifully said. A wonderful place to end. Thank you so much, Stacey, for being here. Thank you so much. I just really appreciate all of your caring that you do for the people, for the planet, for the plants, and for all of us, for bringing us together to have these important conversations. So I'm really grateful for all that you do. Oh, thank you, Stacy. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to the Joyful Garden docu-series, which is happening this week in February 2022. Also, through that link, you'll get a downloadable recipe card for Stacy's flavorful celery salad. If you enjoyed this interview, then before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so that you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your comments about this interview and this lovely aromatic and underrated vegetable. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists, gardeners, and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad you're here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.